right, please turn to the book of Haggai. We're in chapter 2. We'll continue our study this evening of the message prophecy that God gave it through Haggai. Uh, the theme of the book, as we have discussed, especially in the first chapter, talks about the fact that uh, they'd returned from captivity and God was expecting them to rebuild the temple. But instead they were, uh, they quit doing that and they were taking care of their own affairs, building their own houses and so on. And God is telling them that he need, they needed to do the spiritual work that he gave them to do. Uh, in the second chapter, then they've begun to build the temple and he's comparing, they're comparing it to the previous temple and some lessons that are learned from that. Uh, any questions or comments anybody has before we begin this evening? All right, let's go ahead and read some. Well, actually, I have a question before we do that. Um, what have you noticed, if anything, that's different from the book of Haggai as compared to the previous minor prophets we've studied? What differences do you see in this book compared to the previous books? I know I didn't assign that, but uh, Sharon? I don't know if this is what you're looking for, but the people listened. Okay. That's really the, the point, the main point I was looking at. The people actually, actually did what the prophet taught them to do. Why is it different? What's led to that difference? Terry. Uh, Haggai explains to them what's been happening to them is because of their sin. And so what they're suffering is brought upon by their own sin and they um, acknowledge that. Okay, so for one yeah. thing, he's saying the problems they've got are because of their sins. Uh, there's something that along that same line that's even deeper than that though. Karen? Uh, the leadership, uh, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the uh, governor, and uh, the uh, uh, Joshua, the high priest, um, listened and were willing to, to do what I guess it. Okay, so they have good leadership. Uh, that's still not the point I was after, Rick. <laughs> well, they had just been brought out of other nations uh -huh. where they had been dispersed because of their past sins and the past ways they had acted. Okay, and that's the point I was especially after. They've just come back from 70 years of exile because of their sins. You would hope that they've learned something from that, and apparently they have. Now, these other things, of course, are part of it, but the, the special thing we've got to remember is we're in a different point now in their history and different circumstances. They've just come back from having been uh, punished for 70 years, and now they're much more willing to listen. Okay? What was one of the major themes of the minor prophets? In particular, what did he accuse them of? What were they guilty of? the other prophets that we studied. What was one of the main things, again and again, Frank? Idolatry. Idolatry. From this point on, you will not see accusations of idolatry. Other things, yes, uh, especially in the book of Malachi, and of course you get to the New Testament, but there's no indication of the worship of foreign gods like we've seen rebuked again and again and again and again by the previous prophets. They've seemed to have learned that lesson. So apparently they've learned some things. That doesn't mean they're doing what they should. Of course, that's still one of the points of Haggai was that they weren't doing what they should, but again, they listened. So there's a different circumstance compared to what was in the previous books that we've studied. Any other comments on that before we move on? Okay, uh, let's go ahead and read chapter two. Let's read verses five. Through nine. I'd like to read chapter 2, verse 5 through 9 for us, please. Chapter 2, verse 5 through 9. Bill, please. According to the word that I coveted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more it is like a little while. I will shake heaven and earth the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of its latter temple 
shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, now we read verse 5 last time. Um, so what is, in verse 5, what history, what event from their history is he referring to in verse 5? What event is he describing there, Rick? The giving of the covenant. Okay, and the law at Mount Sinai. And uh, so he says, my spirit remains among you. So he's, he remembers his commitment to them and their commitment to him. And so he's still willing to work with them. He sent them into captivity, but he didn't destroy the nation like he did the nations around them and like he had done with Assyria and Babylon. Uh, he wasn't going to do that because he still had a commitment to them. We're going to see that reference to the covenant carry into the next few verses as we uh, look at their fulfillment. Now, questions, let's see, we're in questions number uh, seven. And it really goes through verse, well, at least, well, actually further than this, but through nine at least. And I ask you to understand or discuss this idea of the shaking. He says, once more, verse not six, once more I will shake heaven and earth. He says, it's a little while, so it's not right away. But I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land. I will shake all nations. So I ask you, first of all, what is the significance of that shaking? What does he mean by shaking these things? Now remember, this is prophecy. Sometimes you have symbolic language. Uh, what is the significance of shaking as it's used here? If you, if you, if we gotta, we got to get that to get the whole point. So what thought, Karen? Uh, a great change or awakening. Okay. Okay, other comments? Okay, so it's a major change. Specifically, it's a major change in uh, law or uh, authority or system. Okay. Um, then I ask you that the, the, the New Testament passage that refers back to this, that really helps us explain it and understand it. Question number eight. And what's the New Testament passage that we need to look at? Where are we going to the New Testament to discuss this, to understand it? Terry. Hebrews 12, 26. Hebrews 12. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, what he's t telling us in Haggai makes very little sense, at least it did to me, except if you listen, that you read the fulfillment described in Hebrews chapter 12. And I want to read a lot more than verse 26. I'll go back to verse 18. I want to read 18 through the end of the, well, yeah, through 28 at least. We'd like to read Hebrews 12, verse 18 through 28 for us. It's a long reading, but I think we need the whole context to get the point here. Hebrews 12, verse 18 through 28. Who'd like to read that for us, please? Rick, please. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burn with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it bade that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have not come to the Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, 
yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as the things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. All right. Our God is a consuming fire. Okay, thank you. All right, so notice verse 26 actually quotes from Haggai here. Uh, that is referring to his promise he made in Haggai. But you also notice repeatedly it uses that word shaking. Not only quoting the fact that uh, to Haggai God promised the shaking of earth and the heaven and refers then what that's talking about and, and the application of it. So several times you see that expression there. Well, I'll go back to verse 18 and uh, get the contrast. Verse 18 through 21. He says, you have not come to this. He describes it in verse 18 to 21. What is it in verse 18 to 21 that they had not come to? What's that talking about? That He says, you haven't come to that, Terry. The uh, uh, Mount Sinai, the physical Mount Sinai. Okay, and the giving of the law. Okay. And what were some things that happened in verse 18 through 21? when God gave the law at uh, Sinai. What were some things that happened? Karen. Uh, there was blackness, darkness, tempest, the sound of the trumpet, uh, the voice of words. Um, that was frightening. Okay. A very frightening experience. Okay, and so you've got all this the loud voice and the, the, the trumpet and the fire and the darkness and the tempest and, and if anybody even touched the mountain it was to be killed and Moses said in verse 21 I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling okay that was an event major event in the history of the people remember Haggai just mentioned that in chapter 2 verse 5 that the covenant that God gave when they came out of Egypt so Haggai was talking about that, and the writer of Hebrews talks about it in much more detail. But he says, you haven't come to that. You have come to something different. Verse 22, what have we come to? Not Mount Sinai, but Susie. Well, Mount Zion, or to the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, which is... Referring to what? Heavenly Jerusalem, which is what? God's kingdom. Okay, the kingdom and the church. Verse 23, it's the church. And verse 28, it's the kingdom, which cannot be shaken. All right? So we have a, a different covenant, a different system. At Sinai, God gave a covenant. And now that covenant has been removed, and we've got a different covenant. Okay, now uh, we have a new mediator. Uh, General Assembly of the Firstborn, verse 23. Uh, different uh, mediator, Jesus is a mediator. Uh, the blood of is better uh, than the Old Testament sacrifices. So don't refuse the message uh, of him who now speaks, whose voice, verse 26 now, then shook the earth. What's that talking about? His voice then shook the earth. What's that? When was that, that his voice then shook the earth? Susie? And Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, the giving of the law. Then there was a shaking. The earth shook, but remember the symbolism. When the earth shook, what else happened? Susie? Well, it was the giving of the Mosaic law. Hey. The new, Go ahead. God's new covenant or law. Okay, a complete change in the arrangement or the uh, system of God's dealing with men. He shook the system, meaning that the old system before Mount Sinai was going to be taken away, which would have been basically the patriarchal system and so on. But then they were given the law, the new covenant. So that there was a great, we would call it a shakeup. Okay, removing the old, bringing in the new. 
Okay? With me so far? Questions, comments? All right? But Haggai said, once more, God said, back in Haggai 2 and verse 6, once more, it's a little while, it's going to be a while, but once more I'm going to shake heaven and earth, sea and dry land. All right, so then verse 26, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, reminds us of that. So he says, uh, his, verse, his voice then shook the earth, that's it, in Mount Sinai, but now he has promised once more, I will shake heaven and earth. Okay. Verse 27, what does it refer to? He explains it. What is this shaking, this once more of shaking heaven and earth? What is it? Verse 27. Terry. It's the end of the first covenant that he made to open the way for the second covenant. Okay. So once again, there's going to be a major shaking, a change of system. So the first shaking removed whatever arrangements was before, patriarchal arrangement and so on, and brought in the law of Moses at Mount Sinai. Haggai predicted once more he's going to shake the earth. The writer explains what that's talking about is once again, there would be a removal of the existing system and a bringing in of a new one. That would be the law of Moses removed, replaced with the gospel. And all of the arrangements of the law of Moses replaced by the new kingdom, okay? So that once more, being, things being shaken is explained to us. It's talking about the time when the things that existed then are removed and replaced by something that cannot be shaken. Okay? Questions, comments, discussion? All right. Let's spend a little bit of time on it. Okay. Now yeah, we got that. Uh, okay. All right. I'm getting behind it here. All right. All right. Hopefully this may help. Let's look at this a little bit and see if it helps. The first time there was a shaking, God removed the previous system. He shook the heaven and the earth. He replaced the previous system to give the old covenant, which was to the nation of Israel. They had a physical temple and a kingdom that would be shaken. That is, that kingdom, that system was going to be removed. It wasn't going to be permanent. It would also be shaken. Okay? So the prophecy of a shaking again was the removal of this system to replace it with the new covenant. So from Haggai's view, looking into the future, God said that it would be shaken once more. So that system would be replaced with another system, the gospel. But this one is for all nations. We will see that in just a minute. But we have another temple, but it's not the physical temple. It's the church with its kingdom, and this one will remain. It cannot be shaken. Okay? All right. Is it making sense? Are you with me? Any questions, comments? Because it's not an easy context to understand, I don't think. Uh, Daryl. Um, I have a, a possible answer on this question, but I'm interested in, in what you think. In verse 27, yes. uh, the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, in order that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Uh, what do you make of referring to those old covenant things as created things in contrast to the new covenant? <laughs> okay. Uh, comments? Now, uh, the New King James says things which are made. Okay? Uh, and so Daryl's question is, and it says things that are created. What is the significance of that, uh, uh, Terry? You have a comment? Well, the difference in the physical temporal um, idea of the old covenant, the physical temple, and now it's a spiritual kingdom, things that are not made, there's, there's of spirit. Okay, other comments? Well, that would be my answer to it. Susie, go ahead. Oops. No, Debbie. Well, the old, old system had animal sacrifices, and that was part of their, was demanded of them. And now, the difference is, we go have to sacrifice our lives, are to be sacrificed to serve him. Okay, and we have the sacrifice of Jesus then also. All right, so, yeah, that's what would be my response to, dear. Is that it's the emphasis on the physical of the old law compared to the new, which is 
uh, a spiritual temple, spiritual sacrifices, spiritual kingdom, and so on. Okay? Other comments on that? All right, any other comments? All right, and there's one point I really want to emphasize, though, uh, because I think it's important. Notice he says in verse 27, now this yet once more, which is um, what Haggai said in verse 26, yet once more I will shake heaven and earth. Once more. What's the significance of that fact of once more? Have you thought about that? Why did you say once more? Velma. These will be the last days after that. There will be no more shaking. Okay. Excellent. All right. So that word once is the same word used in the book of Hebrews and other places to refer, for example, to the sacrifice of Jesus in contrast to the Old Testament animal sacrifices that would be repeated again and again. The sacrifice of Jesus would be offered just once. And Jude, verse 3, the gospel was delivered, the faith was delivered once for all. So it's the idea of something that's done one time done so perfectly it does not need to be redone. So from Haggai's viewpoint, God is predicting once more, I'm going to shake heaven and earth. And what that meant was the system of giving them outside would be removed, a new system, a new covenant, but that one is going to remain. It will not be shaken. It will not be removed. It's going to last until Jesus comes again, till the end of time. Okay? It will, not, it will remain Verse 27, it cannot be shaken. It cannot be removed. Verse 28. Okay? Comments? All right. What, what questions does that answer? That help, does that answer any questions for you? That, uh, it answers questions for me. Does it answer questions for you? The fact that it's not going to be shaken again. It's going to remain. Why is that important? Thoughts about that? Susie? Well, we know, we're told how to enter this kingdom that will remain and can't be shaken. Therefore, we know there's not going to be another revelation okay. that's going to tell us something different. Okay. So no new system. Don't expect anything new other than what we've got. We've got the final thing. The gospel, the church, the kingdom, and all that's involved in it. This is it. Don't expect anything else until eternity, until Jesus comes again. For example, sometimes I have wondered, well, if he replaced the law of Moses to give us the New Testament system, what's to say he's not going to replace this system to give us another system? And this is the answer. In fact, Islam says that that's what happened, that Muhammad in his system replaced the New Testament like Jesus in the New Testament replaced the Old Testament. Uh-uh. Can't happen. The system we have will remain. It cannot be shaken. Cannot be replaced. This is it. Until Jesus comes again. Okay? Terry. When you say until Jesus comes again, Yes. You're not indicating that the kingdom ends then. The kingdom is transferred into heaven. Okay. So it becomes a glorified kingdom. So the kingdom continues then, but I, okay, I'm, I'm not trying to make any technical point on that. That wasn't my point. But I think there will be some different laws. The laws won't be the same and so on, but the kingdom will be glorified and continue on into heaven, yes. Okay, other comments? Okay, uh, Susie. Well, just to help build that point okay. throughout the Bible, we know that um, God told David that his kingdom would be eternal. Okay. And um, that Christ is our um, eternal king and that he's our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, which had no beginning or ending symbolically. Uh, so there's other things to build upon that as people would question. Sure, of course there is. All kinds of prophecies predicting the coming of the Messiah and this new kingdom, but we don't have now those kind of prophecies of coming of a, another Messiah, another new kingdom, again, until Jesus returns. Okay. Other comments or discussion? Okay, ready to go back to Haggai? Uh, Terry. 
Well, it also uh, satisfies the the um, legitimacy of our hope because it's not going to change. That what we're hoping for is not going to change. There's no end to it. Yes, and also, I think it would show that we're not going to have a thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. Another it would be another system. That's not going to happen either. We've got the end result, the best that God is going to give on this earth. He's got, we've got it with the gospel and the church and the kingdom. Okay? All right, back to Haggai then, okay? Now then, there's some more information given in Haggai. For back in verse 7, there's something else he says that will shake. Uh, not just heaven and earth, but something else is going to shake. And what's that in verse 7? And now we're in question number 9. What else does he say is going to be shaken? And what's going to happen to him? The nations. The nations. The nations and the nations are who? The Gentiles. Gentiles. And the nations are the Gentiles. So now this new system with this new kingdom and so on, when it once more comes, which is the church, it's also going to include the Gentiles, the nations. They will come, he says, to the desire of all nations. And in the New King James, that's that's. The translators have capitalized that for us. What is the desire of all nations? What's that referring to? Susie? I'm sorry. Uh, okay. The Messiah, or God. Okay. So it's not just the Jews, not just the nation that's going to benefit. Here's another prophecy, just like we studied a lot in the Sunday morning class in Romans 15 and so on. It's for the Gentiles as well. They get it too. They also will come into the desire of all nations. Okay? And God says, then I'll fill the temple with glory. Comments or questions before we go to the temple with, filled with glory? All right, now, he says, I will fill this temple. Now, when you read that, at least for me, it sounds like that temple that they're building, this physical temple. But we've already learned enough now, I hope, to see that it's a spiritual application. This is symbolic. He's not talking primarily about that physical temple that they're building, but he's talking about the temple after things have been shaken with the new kingdom and so on, and that temple would be what? What's the temple under the new system? Susie? Uh, the kingdom. Okay, the kingdom or the church. The church is the, the, the temple. So the temple that they're building is a symbol, symbol is symbolic of the coming temple that God says he'll fill with glory. The church. Okay? Questions, comments? Sharon? Well, this is the answer to the problem that the people in Haggai's day were having, that they're looking at the physical temple and it doesn't look very good compared to the Solomon's temple. But that's I don't know how much they understood this, but the answer is it doesn't really matter because this isn't the ultimate temple anyway. God's bringing a temple that's going to be so much more glorious than anything Solomon could have ever built. Okay. Which also goes to show why all this is so important to God. Why does he want that temple built? It isn't so much that he wants honor. There's a symbolic significance to it. He wants it because he, it's a symbol of what's coming. It's not just about you need this temple to worship in, though they needed it. It's also a symbol of something better coming, something more glorious that's coming, and he wants it to teach them a lesson. This prophecy of the coming future temple, which would be the final goal of what he's attempting to accomplish. Okay? And then that temple will be filled with glory, says the Lord of Hosts. Okay, questions, comments, through verse 7? You know, when you read through the book of Haggai, at least for me, it says, well, that's a pretty simple book. <laughs> it's not simple once you get into it, at least not for me. Now, there's some pretty deep stuff here as far as I'm concerned. Other comments? All right, now then, 
He's, he's still not through with it. Verse 8, and question number 10. What does he say belongs to him? Verse 8. What belongs to him, he says in verse 8. The silver and the gold are mine, he says. Hmm. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. Now, wait a minute. It's just been pointed out that it's not as good as the previous one. But it's going to have a greater glory. I've got the silver and the gold. Now, we use that concept, which is perfectly legitimate. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, to teach that God controls everything, owns everything. And that's true. But what's the point here? In the, in the context, verse question number 10. Why bring this up here? What's it got to do with anything, Terry? Uh, I didn't have this thought till just now, so <laughs> I, I haven't done a lot of research on it. But it, it's that I'm going to supply the glory for that temple. The silver and the gold, I've got it. And I'm going to put the glory when he brings the, the, Jesus into the world, the Messiah comes and, okay. and he but, forms the church. Grandma, was your hand up? Yeah. The thought came to me when I thought about this that silver and gold are things that are pure. They can be refined and they don't disappear like other elements. They stay gold and silver. Okay. So they remain pure and holy. Okay. Back up a little bit though. What was it about the temple that these people were building that wasn't as glorious as they had hoped it would be? What was missing? Gold and silver and gold. All those wonderful things that Solomon had in that temple. And God says, silver and gold is mine. Okay. So does he need our silver and our gold? No. No. Uh, if he'd wanted a temple with silver and gold, could he have provided the silver and the gold to do it? Sure he could. So it, it wasn't... At this point, it wasn't to him about the silver and the gold. There's something more important to him, as some of you have pointed out, the coming kingdom. And the glory of the kingdom that's coming, that's what, that's what this is about to him. Not about physical silver and physical gold. If he wanted that, he could provide that in, in, in spades. There would be no problem with that. But that's not what this is about. Okay? Something greater is coming, and that's what this is about. Okay? Other comments. Uh, so the glory is, uh, in that sense, even this temple that they're building that doesn't seem so glorious is better than the older because it's simple symbolism of God's future plans. Okay? And he will give peace, you see. Spiritual blessings are what's coming. Now, anything else through verse uh, 9? We covered there. Anybody? Questions, comments? I don't want to leave it before you're ready, but if you're ready, we'll go on. Susie. I don't know whether you're going to go here, so I'll just go ahead and ask it. Um, you ask about uh, what in the New Testament symbolizes the temple of the Old Testament. Yes. And I understand uh, the temple and um, uh, the kingdom. Okay. But also uh, in 1 Corinthians 3.17 and 6.19, it talks about the temple of God, which we are. Okay. So to connect those two thoughts together, okay. we, we make up the kingdom. Um, in case somebody would read that and think, oh, this says something different. Um, it's not actually saying something different because we are the kingdom. Yes, and so... And then we're the temple. The temple that he's predicting is the church, the kingdom, which is us. So we're the temple. Not a physical building anymore. And not sugar, not sugar, not silver and gold. It's us. We're the, uh, the temple. We're the one. What God has been planning throughout all. And you see, the, the Jews just got this all mixed up. The premillennial folks still got it all mixed up. To them, it's still physical. It's still an earthly kingdom. It's still reigning from Jerusalem in a, with gold and silver. That's not what it's about. It's a spiritual kingdom in which we 
God dwells with us and in us, and we have the peace that he's planned all throughout the Old Testament history for it. Okay? The culmination of all the history of the world is Jesus dying on the cross, raising, rising again, and giving us uh, the kingdom over which he reigns that we can be citizens in it. Okay? Other questions, comments, discussion? Terry. How does Jesus fit into this picture of the temple? Uh, Say it again. How does Jesus fit into this picture of this temple? Because he describes him, himself um, when he says to the Jews, you, you know, tear this temple down and I'm going to rebuild it in three days. And they, they say that's impossible. It took 46 years to build this. But he describes himself as that, in a way, as that temple, and in um, in Matthew twelve six, when he says something greater than this temple is here, he's he's talking about himself and the kingdom, and so does Jesus. Is Jesus involved in this idea of? Okay. Or is it just the end because the church is his body, but he's still the head of that body. Okay. He's still connected to that body. Okay. And so is there a connection there in this symbolism? Okay, and he's the king of the kingdom and so on. Daryl, what were you going to say? Yeah, on that. Um, I'm going to first go back to Susie's comment uh, to, to talk about Terry's, or to try to answer Terry's comment. Um, Susie, you mentioned the two passages in 1 Corinthians that refer to us as a temple. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those refers to the whole church as a temple. One of those is referring to us individually as temples. Uh, and the idea of, of a temple is the place where God dwells. God dwells with his people, so his people, the church, are a temple. God dwells with individual Christians. And so in that sense, the other passage in 1 Corinthians, uh, each of us individually is a, is a temple. Jesus, Terry, to your question, um, in that human body, God dwelt. That's you know, John chapter 1 as well. Um, God, God dwelt in that body, in the person of Jesus. Um, and so he, is, he was a temple, and, and, and he told the, the Pharisees, you know, destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days, talking about himself, because he was in a, a temple like that, but um, the comparison, I, I think, that that we draw in Haggai is, is what David's talking about, the, the church being a temple. Okay, so the, an illustration can be used in different ways. And I think, in a sense, that was a different use of the word temple with Jesus. But if you go back to Hebrews, you see his connection to this temple. He was the mediator of the New Testament. Uh, we read in Hebrews 12. He was also, from the rest of the book of Hebrews, the sacrifice, the high priest in the temple, and so on. Okay? All right. All right. Thank you very much. Now, 